Okay. Father, we again come before you in the name of Jesus, and we open our spirit to you. And Lord, this reality called friends of the bridegroom, men and women anointed in the forerunner ministry, that you were preparing just a, a very, very short step ahead of others in the body of Christ and the bridal themes to strengthen and empower your church. Lord, I ask that you would enhance that anointing and that reality in our own private lives in these early days before your appearing. We ask you in Jesus' name, even tonight, to continue to release that seal of fire upon our heart, that progressive seal that unfolds just little by little. Continue to seal our hearts in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Okay, session 16. Jesus praises her after the season of testing. Chapter 6, verse 4 to 10. <clears throat> he starts off, You are, oh my love, you are as beautiful as Tirzah, lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. Turn your eyes away from me, for they have overcome me. And the Lord speaks, Your hair, your teeth, your temples. And he speaks uh, uh, about her spiritual maturity. And then, he says, there are 60 queens and 80 concubines and virgins without number, but my dove, my perfect one, is the only one, the only one of her mother, the favorite of the one who bore her. The daughter saw her and called her blessed, the queens and the concubines, and they praised her. Who is she who looks forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and awesome as an army with banners? The bride, as you know, has uh, asked the daughters of Jerusalem to help her find the Lord's presence. And Jesus has not spoken to her since chapter 5, verse 2, when he said, Open up to me, my beloved, when his hair was drenched in the dew of the night. That was the last words he spoke to her. She arose and opened up to him, and he's been silent ever since. She's... She was dialoguing with the maidens, and the Lord suddenly interrupts to communicate His feelings for her. He praises the bride in an extravagant way. The statement from Jesus, this statement from Jesus, is as powerful as the one the bride spoke to Him in chapter 5, verse 10 to 16. Again, uh, the passage we just looked at was answering one of the powerful longings in our spirit, the longing to be fascinated. And the Lord best answers that longing with the revelation of the beauty of the Lord. I mentioned last session that in chapter 4, the longing for the, for the assurance that we are enjoyed, she answers in the chapter of the ravished heart of the bridegroom. Chapter 5, the longing to be fascinated. Here in chapter 6, three very specific longings that I identify in a practical way in the, in the term I call the bridal paradigm. The longing to be adorned, the longing to feel beautiful is the first longing that she addresses. Secondly, the longing for intimacy without shame. And thirdly, the longing for greatness. These three longings, the Lord answers them one by one in, in the most profound and powerful way. Roman numeral two, Jesus describes her beauty. He breaks the silence suddenly. He was absent, but now he is manifesting his presence. Jesus responds after witnessing her extravagant worship. He was silent through the entire test. And of course, that's what constituted one part of the test. The spiritual crisis, the silence of the Lord, the withdrawing of his presence, the discernible presence, and the withholding of his word to her. And she lived by the word. However, in the difficulty, she replied, he's outstanding, he's dazzling, he strikes my heart. And the fact that he's altogether beauty, and she said, I, beautiful, she said, I'm lovesick. Now the Lord gives her a threefold praise in verse 4 using three different metaphors. He breaks the silence to reassure her of his great love for her in this season of testing. Oh, my love. His first utterance to her, he communicates his, his affection. This phrase expresses how he feels about her. Every time in the song when the Lord speaks, he always prefaces, prefaces it by, Oh my love, or beautiful one. 
When the Lord speaks to us, He may not always use that phrase, but that's always the atmosphere of His heart. That's always the, if, if it's okay to use the word paradigm related to God's view, it's always the paradigm God is speaking through and through the paradigm of loving and delighting in us, even when He corrects us. He corrects us with an oh my love in His Spirit towards us. Jesus celebrates the marvelous beauty worked in her by the Holy Spirit. He goes, you are as beautiful as, and he says, tears on, lovely as Jerusalem, as awesome as an army of banner. But it's the phrase, you are as beautiful as, nine times in the song, the bridegroom affirms her beauty. Again, he's touching this longing that every one of us have. We cannot repent our way out of this longing the beautiful God put a longing in all of his, uh, 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 in all the human race, a longing for beauty, to possess beauty and to feel the beauty they possess. Not only to have it in ignorance, but to have it and to feel the possession of it. To feel beautiful is how God feels. To feel beautiful is a very powerful reality and it takes a, 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 a clear and a precise understanding of truth to understand the nature of our beauty. It's a very uh, confusing concept, the issue of beauty, because there's natural beauty, there's spiritual beauty, there's sinful things that appear beautiful, there's temporal and there's eternal beauty, and the Lord administrates all of those facets of beauty through our one longing to possess beauty. He administrates the combination of those in a very strategic and precise way. It's not a, it's not a simple idea. It's not, well, that's wonderful. It takes some some digging in the Word of God to sort out some of the different arenas between uh, natural beauty, spiritual beauty, and sinful beauty, if you can use those, or beauty that's related to sinful desires. And, and then to mix those, uh, to combine those with eternal versus natural, I mean, versus temporal beauty. But the Lord, the beautiful God longs to make His people beautiful. And then to feel, to have the actual feeling of possessing it is a very dynamic and powerful feeling. It's the absence of that feeling that causes us to go on many destructive uh, uh, tangents in our walk with the Lord. It's our longing not just to possess it, but to feel it, to feel beautiful. It's the um, a misuse of that God-given longing, the beautiful God putting the longing for beauty in us. A, a uh, uh, mismanagement of that longing creates many destructive desires. I've mentioned several times that many eating disorders and sexual dysfunctions and sexual disorders are related to the confusion around the issue of feeling beautiful and the truth of it. And the beautiful God wants to crown us with beauty and He wants us to delight in the feeling of it. Very, very significant subject. Now, just the, just the subject beautiful is a, there's relative beauty and then there's absolute beauty. Relative beauty is beauty that's in the eyes of the beholder. It's relative to whoever is looking determines if something's beautiful. And there's quite a bit of philosophy around when is beauty truly beauty? And that's a pretty vast subject that the philosophers through history have tackled. But there's a thing that I call absolute beauty of which the absolute one alone has the authority to define. It is beautiful because the indescribably beautiful one declares it as beautiful. It's not open to any relative definitions uh, according to the observer. The one, the branch of the Lord who possesses eternal beauty declares what is beautiful. He's the one speaking. It's very powerful. When is beauty truly beauty? That's a, 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 a subject that plagues the hearts of many people, though they don't necessarily have to use that language. That uncertainty is unsettling. When is beauty enough beauty? When is it enough? How long will it last? Well, the Lord has a answers in the realm of absolute beauty of, to every one of these. How much of it is enough? God is going to fill, uh, fully uh, encompass our whole being in the beauty of the Lord. And He's speaking now from the uh, perspective of eternity through the lens of spiritual reality. And He sees her. And he declares, oh, how beautiful you are to me. That is a stunning reality that is so powerful to the human emotions. 
Again, he's touching that longing to be adorned. And then in a moment, he's going to touch the longing for intimacy in verse 5, and then the longing for greatness in verse 8, 9, and 10. Nine times in the song, the bridegroom affirms her beauty. Her beauty is the fruit of the divine testing that she just went through. Her beauty is the, refru- is the fruit of her obedient responses. Her beauty is the fruit of the revelation of his affection for her. The knowledge of how Jesus loves her makes her beautiful. It makes her radiant. When we feel loved, when we have the assurance of a, of a, of that we're enjoyed, even in our weakness, something is awakened in us, and then her love back to Jesus beautifies and adorns her life. When the Lord establishes the first commandment as first in the life of, the, of believers, it beautifies that believer in many different ways. The Father is adorning or He's making beautiful a people for Himself through His Spirit. The gift of righteousness through trials and tribulations. The Lord, the altogether beautiful one of chapter 5, verse 16, the altogether lovely one, the dazzling one, declares she is dazzling and she is beautiful. It's one thing if somebody with no experience of beauty beholds you as beautiful. It's another thing when the altogether, infinite and eternal, the one that possesses infinite and eternal beauty declares you as possessing stunning beauty. Beloved, that's an absolute statement. Nobody can take that from you. I don't care what happens to your physical body. I don't care what happens to your ministry. I don't care what happens to your economic uh, situation on the earth. No one can take that declaration from you. Nobody can. It is yours forever and forever. And to live in it is to make you powerful right now. And that's part of the Friends of the Bridegroom message in the bridal paradigm. He says, oh, my love. And he says, you are as beautiful as Tirzah. Tirzah was a city in the northern part of Israel that was known for its beauty. Beautiful, its beauty. And uh, you can do a study on Tirzah in the Old Testament as well as a study of Tirzah in, in history, in Bible history. That's even uh, the, you know, the historians that you can develop the fuller understanding of why Tirzah was a beautiful city. And I've done a bit of that, and that's one of the things I want to cover on this uh, I want to spend an evening talking on that verse. It's fascinating, the full ramifications, but I just challenge you to go search these things out a bit on your own. He says, now you are as lovely as Jerusalem. She's beautiful and she's lovely. I I haven't uh, uh, distinguished the Hebrew words that are used here, but I'm sure there's meaning, there's distinction that is intended by the Lord. Jerusalem is the national center of worship amongst the redeemed worldwide at the time this song was was written. It is the holy city. It's where the presence of God dwelt in Solomon's temple there in Jerusalem. I mean, Solomon's temple where the power of God's Shekinah glory dwelled above the Ark of the Covenant is right there. And he's he's saying that you you have the spiritual beauty of this spiritual city of Jerusalem. Now he's going to talk about the beauty of her spiritual victory. He says, you are as awesome as an army with banners. Three words. I mean, I long that the Spirit of God would capture our hearts with these three words. This is the uncreated God who possesses beauty and power saying to you, you're beautiful, you're lovely, you're awesome. Those are three very powerful words of which the implications of them are far bigger than I believe our capacity to grasp them. Those three words excite me. I stare at them and say, Holy Spirit, open up those three words from the heart of the Son of God about my life and the life of God's people who are struggling and stumbling. I can't help but believe those three words will transform the way we see ourselves. Lovely, beautiful, awesome. Of of course, uh, when we look at the word awesome, the word awesome in the Old Testament is typically associated with manifestations of God's power. His power is... is, uh, referred to as set forth as being awesome. And what he's saying here is that the awesome manifestation of divine power has been released into your spirit, into your being. And it's the awesomeness of God's power because awesomeness is typically associated with God's manifest power. And he's saying this about her. Okay, now, awesome is an army with banners. 
An army with banners speaks of a victorious army. When an army returned victorious from war, it marched down the street with banners. The victorious army would go first with their banners, and then they led the defeated king in chains behind them in a great military procession. The prisoners followed the captive king in chains as they marched down the street. A defeated army lost its banners. Therefore, they never came home to march in the military parade with banners. So when he says, you're an army with banners, the implication is you've been at war and you've come home victorious. And of course, the war was chapter 5, verse 6 and 7, the twofold test. The, The critical issue that was at stake, the great war over her soul, would she be lovesick or would she be offended? Would she press in in disappointment, spiritual crisis as well as circumstantial crisis, or would she would she press into God as a mature, lovesick believer, or would she draw back and let her lovesickness wane? That is the great object of spiritual warfare. The uh, spiritual warfare has many dimensions to it, but the central issue of spiritual warfare, the central pinnacle issue is always the first commandment in the heart of the believer. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and 11, especially 11, chapter 10, verse 4 and 5, and chapter 11, verse 2 and 3, where Paul presents spiritual warfare in the clearest statement, uh, equal even to Ephesians chapter 6. He gives more details in 2 Corinthians 10 and 11. He, he, causes, he uh, uh, reveals the central focus of spiritual warfare is the ability for the believer to walk in the first commandment. It's a very fascinating teaching. Spiritual warfare has many dimensions to it, but there's no dimension higher than that dimension. Even the, the outworking of spiritual warfare that releases evangelism is unto unbelievers loving Jesus. It's really the beginning stages of the first commandment. And so he's uh, addressing the issue of spiritual warfare. He says, you've been at war. And there's many dimensions of warfare, but you've been at the very front of the battle. The very pinnacle issue was at stake. Your lovesick heart. In the words of 2 Corinthians 11. Verse 3, would you lose the simplicity and purity of devotion to Jesus, or would it be strengthened? That was the issue of warfare in 2 Corinthians 11. Verse 3, she came through the twofold test. She came through the war. It's a victorious army. She has her banners. She's coming home in the procession. The Lord says, you won. You won. You defeated the greatest enemy, the enemy that's inside your soul that is vulnerable to Satan's lies, the unrenewed mind. You've won. The time of testing, the Holy Spirit pours loyal love into the heart. That's the awesome manifestation. That's the awesome part. The Holy Spirit pours supernatural impartation of the love of God into her heart. He says, you've conquered the sinful passions of your own heart by the Spirit. You've struggled. You've defeated the greatest enemies of your soul for which Satan takes advantage of the greatest enemy. Our greatest enemy is the unrenewed mind. Satan is powerless before the the name of Jesus and the renewed mind. But it's the the seed of power or the or the place of decision making is at the very core of the human spirit and it's the unrenewed mind that leaves us weak and defenseless most of warfare is centered or associated with the word of god entering the mind because when the word of god enters our mind things happen and we become strong on the inside and then we we can overcome all kinds of significant yet secondary dimensions of spiritual warfare but with an unrenewed mind We are nearly defenseless, except the sovereignty of God never allows it to go beyond that which we can handle even in our immaturity. The sovereignty of God is our great protector, but we don't want to just make it. We want to mature. We want to be vibrant in lovesickness. We want to come home awesome as an army with banners. We want to return from the battle with vibrant lovesickness. The awesome is an army with banners. So verse 4, he's talked... A very, very vast theme. He has touched her longing to be adorned, to be beautiful, to be lovely, and to enter into this, the beauty of the first commandment, of walking in the awesome experience of the power of God. This is a, he's, he's, he, it's a dimension of intimacy, her cry for intimacy. Turn your eyes away from me, for they have overcome me. The bride's awesome loveliness to Jesus in contrast to her response of love and worship in the midst of trials. Jesus is overcome with the irresistible love of his bride. 
This is one of the most dramatic passages in the whole Bible. The Holy Spirit uses Solomon's words of love for the maiden to reveal Jesus' passion for his people. The Holy Spirit extols the glory of earthly married love and also the glory of eternal bridal love. Both dimensions of redeemed life are being extolled by God. But eternal bridal love is the highest theme on the Holy Spirit's mind. This is one of the great statements in the Word of God. God, overwhelmed by weak people, submitted to the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. He says, you've overcome me, rather than rebuking her for her alleged disobedience. Back in chapter 5, verse 3, again, a number of commentaries will say in chapter 5, 3, when she said, my feet are, are, are clean, how can I defile them again? They take that as, as, a, as disobedience. He says, you've overcome me with your your abandonment to me. He looks at her. This is one of the the blessings of the verse in John. Is it John 20 or John 21 where Jesus told Thomas, blessed are those that believe without seeing. When we believe without seeing, there's a certain blessedness. And part of that blessedness is the heart of God is moved when in blind faith we obey And not that his heart won't be moved in eternity, but there's a dimension of blessedness that is only for this age. Another dimension of that blessedness of of believing without seeing is, uh, I love to say, is that the eternal rewards, the exchange rate is so high. Even for a cup of cold water in this age, we get rewarded extravagantly beyond measure for every act of obedience while we're operating in the believing without seeing phase, very brief phase of our eternal life. But one dimension is the heart of God is moved. He says, you're blind. You have sin in your members. Your mind is unrenewed. Uh, you're, you're blind in this sense. You don't, uh, I'd rather say this way, you don't have uh, open vision. You don't see face to face like the angels do. But you love me. He goes, I love this when you love me like this. She feels nothing. He feels everything that's good. And now she's beginning to understand that. This, But for our benefit, we understand it even now. And the most dramatic passages in the scripture. When he says, turn your eyes away from me. Turn your eyes away. Turn the gaze of your devotion away. Jesus was not asking her to literally look away from her. He wasn't asking her to stop worshiping him. He was speaking in the extravagant language of romantic poetry. This is divine romance. He's speaking in love language. It's a statement depicting the hold she had upon his heart. It's the kind of grace manifested in Moses' life when the Lord told Moses, let me alone when Moses was interceding. And let Moses before God said, no, and prevailed upon the heart of God. That's powerful. This is the kind of, the romance of God that, that, uh, that gently pushes us away. And if we can be denied, we go away. But it awakens the love that can't be denied. When the Lord told Moses, no, it awakened a fiery, irresistible resolve in Moses for which the Lord's purpose was to awaken that in the intercessor. It's the very same thing happening here. He tells uh, Jacob in Genesis 32, let go of me. And Jacob goes, no, not until I'm blessed. It awakened a resolve, an irresistible and unrelenting resolve. And then then Jacob prevailed. It's the same thing's happening here. He says, Turn away, draw back. Your eyes have conquered my heart. And and of course, the lovesick bride could no more obey that, but it awakens a fierce determination in her. And of course, that's the Lord's purpose in this. Jesus could not withstand her gazing affection any more than one man could stand against an entire army. He says, your eyes have overcome me. The love of fallen, broken people overwhelms him when they when they love him by faith without seeing face to face like we will in the age to come. Imagine the uncreated God speaking in such a way to people on the earth. Seven, his irresistible love, her irresistible love overwhelms the heart of God. In this age, we will never fully understand the powerful impact we have on the heart of Jesus. She could never have imagined the way that she would get this response from him when she was going through the testing in verse 6 when the presence and the voice of God was withdrawn. The manifest presence and that discernible voice of God to her spirit was withdrawn. She could have never imagined that he felt so deeply about her when she felt so little. Heart of a dedicated, fully obedient believer 
prevails, triumphs over the heart of God. The people that triumph over their own heart so as not to deny the Lord, they also triumph over the Lord's heart. Let me say that again. People that triumph over their own heart, they refuse to yield to the impulses of sin. They triumph over the Lord's heart in a, in, in, in a, in a special way. Nine, we don't e- easily understand the heart of Jesus being ravished in 4.9, but here it's, he's overcome. It's, he was ravished by a look, by a glance, by the movements of her heart to him. By one glance, one look, the intention, the individual detention, intentions of her heart to obey ravished him. She is gazing at him and has fully overcome him. It, it's, it's a significantly stronger statement. What overwhelms God? He spans the heavens with his hands. He effortlessly counts the stars. He shakes the mountains, subdues the oceans. The stars and the vast oceans don't overwhelm him. They're nothing before him. What overwhelms him? The stars don't. The oceans don't. The armies of history don't. No army can overwhelm him. He steps into time with the armies of God. The demonic demonic powers and principalities cannot conquer him. He is the ultimate warrior, but he is so conquered by the devotion of human beings on the earth under the power of the Holy Spirit. Beloved, this is stunning reality. This is true about you. You can wait and discover this in eternity, or you can walk in the enjoyment And even more than that, the the power that comes from the enjoyment of this reality now. You can walk in it now. Oh, I want to enjoy it, but I want to be empowered by enjoying it as well. This is the kind of reality that will make us stand fearless before the rage of Satan at the end of the age. He says, I'll take your money, I'll take your things from you, I'll make your reputation bad, but a heart enjoying this, the power of this enjoyment will be like, This means nothing to me compared to the power of carrying the reward on the inside with me. This is how we carry the reward on the inside with us. We love to to be loved, to feel loved, and we love to feel loved back. Again, we love the loving feeling. We love to feel it from Him. We love to feel it back, and that's what's going on. It makes that, the enjoyment of that makes us powerful and fearless. And it comes through a renewed mind. No one can overcome him or conquer him. Yet one thing has subdued him, the gaze of his bride. He says, you've overcome me. I relate this to intimacy. Open wide the gates of his heart to only one class of the all of created order, the redeemed. He opens wide his heart. The overwhelmed heart is the fully opened heart is the implication. He says, there is nothing that I will withhold from you that I can give you. It's not that I'm interested. It's not that I'm committed. I am conquered by you. Open wide the gates of my heart, he would say. He opens wide the gates of his heart. He says, all things the Father has given unto me, I give them to you. He says this in John 17. Beloved, he's inviting us into a position far beyond the the seraphim and the cherubim, far beyond the archangels. He's inviting us into a place of such an open heart. He told her in 5.2, open your heart to me. Here in 6.5, the implication is I have opened wide my heart to you. I am conquered by you. There's nothing in me that pushes you away. All things that are mine are yours in God. 5.2, he says, open your heart. 6.5, 6.5, he is opening his heart. Beloved, the implications of this, the intimacy with the Godhead implied by this statement. Now, some people would read this and they would say, well, you know, this is pretty neat stuff, but it is Song of Solomon, and because I've never read it before, it doesn't really seem like the Scripture for real. Beloved, this is the very Word of God. This is as much the Scripture as the Gospel of John and the book of Romans. The fact that it might be new to some people and does not take one thing from it as being the very Word of God. And in all the Scriptures, the Holy Spirit talks of Jesus. He is talking of Jesus right now to us. It's not all he's talking about. He is extolling the beauty of married love, but he's doing something far greater. He's talking about the beauty of eternal bridal love that goes on for the ages and the ages and the ages. Oh, I love this. He opens wide his heart to us. There's nothing he will withhold. 
The ultimate warrior is easily conquered by the devotion of his wife. He looks at Satan. He looks at the end time armies that stand against him. All the kings of the earth. He vanquishes them with one word of his mouth. They are nothing before him. They don't even present a challenge to him. But his bride conquers his heart. You have conquered his heart. Jesus describes her spiritual maturity. Now, th- now he talks about her hair, her teeth, and her temples. Or her uh, cheeks. The Hebrew word temples is, is the same word as cheeks. It's the word emotions. He picks out three facets of which we're going to skip this and let you read on your own. It's very similar to chapter 4, verse 1 to, th- 1 to 5. He picks three, he, he focuses on three uh, uh, facets of her, person- of, of her spiritual life. Her hair, her dedication, her teeth, her life in the word of God. And three, her, her emotions, her temples, her, her cheeks, her emotions. Now it's interesting in this that we compare the hair, her hair, her teeth, and her uh, uh, cheeks or temples to his back in chapter 5. Her hair, compared to chapter 5, 11, his hair. Her teeth, compare it to chapter 5, verse 13, his lips. His lips are the word of God. Her teeth speaks of her ability to receive the meat of the word. And then her temples go back to chapter 5, verse 13, his cheeks. Her emotional life is a reflection of his. Compare them. And it's a, it's a beautiful study to compare them because it's an interesting that these are the three aspects. Her dedication, her life in the word, and her godly emotional transfer, uh, the emotional transformation. The spiritual ki- emotional chemistry change happening. It says your dedication, the yes in your spirit, your tenacious life in the word of God, and then the natural uh, outcome is her emotions are impacted. These are three things, her dedication, her life in the Word, and her godly emotions. These things enhance the intimacy talked about in verse 5. When he opens his heart, he's saying, for you to enjoy the opened heart of God, the overcome, the open, the, the heart with the open gates wide, you have to be dedicated, you have to live by the Word of God, for I am the Word of God. And your emotions will become like my emotions in due time. So verse 5 to 7 is directly related to the the conquered heart of God beckoning her to come and enter into the reality of his open heart. And and he's describing the ways for which her spiritual maturity will enhance her ability to enter into the the conquered, the the overcome heart of our God towards us. Oh, I want to enter into that in a greater way. I want to sit at that table and feast. So he talks about her spiritual maturity there, her, her, uh, her hair, her teeth, and her cheeks, or her temples. Now, he's going to, in from verse 8 to 10, oh, magnificent. We'll look at each verse. He's going to now touch this longing for greatness. Verses 8 to 10, he's going to, he's declaring to her, now that she has said yes to intimacy with him, he says, in the place of my intimate embrace, let me tell you, you are there is ordained for you a position of preeminence among creation. Jesus is preeminent over all things. The bride is in the highest place of created order. Now he's beckoning her to understand her destiny of greatness. Beloved, we married into the monarchy. We married into incredible wealth and power. And there's no way you can ever be free from that. You will be wealthy and powerful forever. You're part of the aristocracy of eternity forever and forever and forever. You married into it. And he's, and he's allowing her to know this poor beggar, this beggar harlot on the earth, he's allowing her to know the measure of the wealth and the power that she walks into when she enters into his overcome heart of intimacy towards her. He says, when I give you my heart, I give you my kingdom. All things the Father has given to me, they follow in the giving of my heart to you. All things that I possess are yours, is what he's saying to her. How could I give you my heart and not give you the position of power and influence and wealth that I possess, or to share it with you? This beggar, harlot, prostitute, filled with demons, rebellious against God, who's washed and cleansed, is entering into the ultimate love story of all the ages. The king 
was so interested in her, he kissed her and awakened her heart with the kisses of his mouth, and she sees the vast world that is hers. Beloved, this isn't a fairy tale. The fairy tales of history came out of the longings of the human heart that were put there by God. These fairy tales are the, are, 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 is the human expression I'm not saying that God hasn't inspired in some of them through all the many in history, but it's the human longing for the beggarly prostitute harlot to enter into greatness in a sudden change of events of grandeur and romance. It's a true, it's true. It is the true testimony of God. It is your story. This truth will make us stand before Satan, powerful, fearless. It says in Hebrews 10, they joyfully accepted the seizure of their pop- property. You know why? They knew they owned the eternal city. When you know you have millions, you don't get in a big fluff over somebody stealing a few dollars from you. Their soul was anchored in the reality. They owned the universes were there. The whole universe was theirs. 1 Corinthians 3, 20, 2 and 23, Jesus, Paul the apostle said, he made everything for you. Everything is yours. Everything was made for you. When that touches us, and that's what's related here, oh, we become powerful. We can joyfully accept the seizure of our property. They can even take our mailing list and disrupt our ministry. The meetings may get smaller. So what? We're wealthy beyond description. We're part of the aristocracy. We have such power and wealth and beauty. We've conquered his heart. So few people come to the meetings. So what? It's not what life is about. So a few people look at you and shake their head. So what? At the end of the day. Beloved, who are we? We're royalty. We're we're the ones that have ravished him. And then we have conquered his heart by his own will, by his own decree. He has allowed this to happen. What a king. I tell you, the unrelenting gratitude this awakes in our hearts forever and forever and forever. Amen? Page 13, the royal courts of the heavenly bridegroom. There are 60 queens, 80 concubines, and virgins without numbers. Without number. Jesus is comparing. Well, let me say it differently. I'm just going to sum it up. In a king's court, there are many levels of rank and degrees of glory. In Solomon's court, in any king's court, there's, there's, there's various ranks of of honor, ranks of power, and ranks of authority is the point. In the court of King Jesus, there's angelic beings of all, there's cherubim, there's seraphim, there's, there's the archangels, there's many ranks within God's, around, uh, of uh, beings of splendor around the court of God. Various degrees of splendor, various degrees of authority, various degrees of honor, all around Jesus' court, just like Solomon's court. And Solomon says, let me tell you, of all those, those honored ones around the king's court, my court, the King Solomon, he says, you, that's the point he's going to make. He goes, you surpass all of them. And that's what Jesus says, of all of the esteemed ones around my court, there is none like you, he says to the bride. He says, of all the different ranks in the king's court, you are my dove, my perfect one. My dove, my perfect one, is the only one, the only one of her mother. She is the favorite of the one who bore her. The daughters saw her and called her blessed. The queens and the concubines, and they praised her. Jesus is unique, the bride's unique honor before Jesus. He looks at her and he says, he says, of all those uh, esteemed and uh, uh, beings of splendor around the king's court, he says, you and you alone, O bride of Christ, through history. You are my dove, my perfect one. You are the only one. You are the only one in my heart. Yes, I have created them, and I honor them, and I enjoy them, but you have entered into the very fabric of my heart. You have touched my heart. You've touched me. The infinitely powerful warrior has been touched The very arrow of God's love is beaming within his own heart. He's the author of it. It's touched him. How could one with such power and such wisdom and such brilliance and such wealth and such genius, how could he be touched by a beggar prostitute on the earth, a harlot on the earth, who cared not for God, who lived in agreement with demons, who threw out the word of God and called it false, who worshipped idols before their conversion. Talking about the saints through history. But this beggar touched his heart. He took upon himself the form of a man. 
He came to the earth and he was crushed by the wrath of God. He says, you're the only one that's touched my heart. You got me. Of course, we know, and I have it in the notes here, that in the foreplanning of God, God created only one part of, the, all of all the created order. He created us as a suitable companion. He created us like unto Him. He created us according to His liking. In Genesis 1, the human spirit was made like unto Him in His image so that we would be according to what was suitable to Him. He built us. He designed us according to His liking. It was a plan from the beginning to have a bride. Beloved, go home and look in the mirror and just say, this is, this is big. This is really big. Before you take stock of your life and define your life by your bank account and the lack of anointing and how few friends you have and what you look like, define yourself by the conquered one, the great warrior who's been conquered by you by his own decree. Define yourself by that. Beloved, this, this, I'm not trying to be corny. This is big. This is serious. This is what defines you. This is my dove. My perfect one. The only one. The only one. The unrivaled one. The only one that's actually touched his heart. He won't die for angels. He won't die for the fallen angels that are demons. He won't do it. He won't die for cherubim or seraphim. He won't change. He won't lay aside the form of God. There's only one that's touched his heart. It's humans. He has this, this ravishing desire for human beings. He became one forever. The uncreated God, second person of the Trinity, is a human. Can you fathom this? And God crowned a human as the head of his empire. And this human wants a human bride forever and forever. And he wants her to come forth in voluntary love. And that's you. He has only one that has completely touched him and conquered him. Beloved, this is what defines you. The bride's unique honor and redemptive history. He says, not only are you the only one, my favorite one. Not only are you the only one that has touched me. He says, you're the favorite of your mother. You're my favorite, but you're the favorite of your mother as well. Jesus is saying two things. He goes, you're my favorite and you're the favorite of your mother. The, the, the redeemed community through history functions in two ways. We are, the church through history is called the mother of the redeemed. A number of times in Scripture, the, the imagery is clear from Genesis to Revelation. You put them together, and I did it earlier on. The agency that God uses to bring forth the birthing of new ones is the church. He uses you to bring others, to birth others, to travail till others are birthed. The redeemed laboring in partnership is depicted as a mother. And then the very redeemed are the bride that are brought forth out of history. We're the favorite of Jesus. The bride is the favorite of Jesus, and the bride is also the favorite of the church, which means that when the church looks back over history, those that walk in the first commandment to first, in first place are the most esteemed through history when it's all said and done. And we don't typically like people that do it, that live next to us, because they disrupt us, and it's too convicting. We love their stories as long as they're gone, they're dead and gone at least a hundred years. Preferably from another country. That just makes it, they're perfectly safe. Their stories fill the pulpits and the libraries of church history. The favorite one of the redeemed in history are those that have pressed into bridal love. They not have not have all necessarily call it bridal love, but they press into this, this place of abandonment because the bride is the redeemed, but I'm using the bride as I have it written here. It's the, the earthly practical definition of the bride is those walking in bridal love. We're, we're all the bride in eternity, but we're walking in the spirit of the bride now. We're wanting to love like the bride loves now. She says, you're, Jesus says, you're my favorite one. And he says, when history is all said and done, those that have counted their lives as nothing, whether they ever were rich and famous in the gospel, were ever an anointed apostle, at the end of the day, the ones the bride, I mean, the ones the redeemed through history, the daughters of Jerusalem, are really fascinated by the lovesick ones through history. He goes, You've, you're my favorite, and you're the favorite through history, those that have pressed in. 
And I developed the logic and put all the verses of that, and you can work it out just little by little on your own. Also, our, one of our great favorite tasks in history is to awaken others in bridal love. It's our, you know, as a, as a person, I want to be used as a person to awaken this, to cause it to be birthed in others, and that way I'm functioning in that mother role. We all are when we lead others into new discoveries. We birth new truths in cooperation with the Holy Spirit in partnership with the Lord. And oh, we long that those are birthed into that bridal fervency. But when it's all said and done, who are the ones we read? We read David, the lovesick man in the Old Testament. We love the man after God's own heart, don't we? We love Mary of Bethany. We love Paul the Apostle, not just because he was famous, because he endured in such loyal abandonment in prison. We love it. Those are the favorite of the mother. Those are the favorite of the redeemed in history. Those are the ones that church history enjoys. And a third dimension, we're the favorite ones. We're unique in honor before the angelic hosts. Those amongst the royal court, the, the queens and the concubines, those are used as those of the king's royal court. Those of various rank in Solomon's court were the, were the queens and the concubines. Those spoke of those of various rank around King Jesus' royal court. Of course, that's the various rank and uh, of the angelic beings, they praise her. They enjoy the dove, the one with the, the dove church in the Holy Spirit, the church with the dove heart. The church with the dove eyes becomes the church with the dove heart. My dove, the one that lives in the Holy Spirit is what he's talking about. The angels call her blessed. The queens and the concubines, they call her blessed. Jesus says, you're my favorite. You're the favorite of redeemed history. You're the favorite of the rank of the host of heaven. It's really true. The first commandment is truly first. Not only will God make it first before He returns, it will be honored as first forever and forever. Those that have pressed in to the first commandment being first, the rewards are the highest. The remembrance is the greatest. The first commandment it's not that it ought to be first. It is first in the, in the economy of God. It always is. And there's these folks that are tucked away back in hills and faraway places that the Western world will never esteem or have parades or read their books. There are these devoted, lovesick servants out of the way serving the Lord. I tell you, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the day of eternity, I call the judgment seat of Christ the great equalizer. These unknown, lovesick, forgotten people of the earth will be the great ones, the highly rewarded ones. And some of the, the famous preachers of the earth will be significantly less crowned in glory than these in the, in the, because there's various realms of glory in the resurrection. Now there's a fourfold description of her ultimate glory. This is fantastic. Not only is she Above all the, 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 those in the courts of heaven, and not only is she Jesus' favorite, she's not only the favorite of her mother, the redeemed of history, she's not only the favorite of the subjects in the king's court, the concubines and the queens, it's more than that. She shines forth, or she looks forth as the morning. She's as beautiful or as fair as the moon. She's as bright and shining as the sun, and she's as awesome as an army with banners. It ends with this. And the whole statement from verse 4 to 10 is just, it equals in splendor, if not greater, it equals chapter 5, verse 10 to 16. These are the two, this is the one-two punch that nobody can, can withstand if it touches their heart, these two chapters. I was the son of a boxer, so that's where I got that, the one-two punch. That probably didn't relate to everybody, but uh, <clears throat> how about this, the real beautiful notes in the symphony. There you go, that's a better way to say it. Who is she that shines forth like the dawn, like the morning? Who is she that is as fair as the moon, as beautiful as the moon? Who is she that is as clear and as bright and shining as the sun? Who is she that is awesome as an army with banners? The bride is crowned in Jesus' glory. In Hebrews 2, it talks about that God has crowned the redeemed with glory and honor. He crowns us. This is a fourfold crown. All four metaphors here show her uncommon beauty. Comparing her, listen, this is important, comparing her to heavenly objects. This is similar to Jesus comparing her to earthly cities, Jerusalem and Tirzah back in 
She's compared to earthly cities and now to heavenly objects. This is a a greater affirmation being spoken here in verse 10. Verse 10 is more intense than verse 4. Though it's a similar, you'll compare it, and they're similar, the language is similar. The sentence, awesome as an army with banners, is the same in both verses. But one is speaking of her life in the natural, and her other is her life in the spirit, her life in eternity, I mean. We'll look at that in a moment. Who is she? This is a rhetorical question. I believe the Holy Spirit is the one trumpeting this. It talks about her personal victory. She shines forth like the morning. Or she looks forth, she like the dawn. It says it says shines forth as the as the dawn in one version. Now in the morning, the dawn, this is matter of fact, there's there's four dimensions of glory that are growing in intensity in these four statements. All, each one of them builds and takes it another step higher. All four of them go up a notch, a notch higher. He says that. You shine forth like the sun, like the dawning morning, like in your struggle, you began to enter into a little bit of the light. It's a lot of light compared to the others. But when you see eternity, you'll understand it's only the night, it's the light that is removing the shadows out of your life, the life of compromise. And I develop why the morning, the dawn, where the shadows still exist, she's coming forth in the beginnings of victory, the light, the early light of victory in the early day. It's not the full day yet. So she has personal victory as the shining dawn. She is used as a source of light in a dark and fallen world. She's as beautiful as the moon. The moon was ordained by God to be a... a, The moon has, has no light of its own, does it? The moon only operates with reflected light. Derives its light from another source, the sun. It has no light of its own. But the moon is declared in Genesis 1. I have the notes here. The moon was declared as God's light in the dark time. He says, you will rule the night. You will bring light in the night. And in the darkness of this fallen world, this age is depicted a number of times in the scripture as the dark night, as the night. The, the, the resurrection is called the day. He says, you're, you're shining like the dawn. You're overcoming all the compromise in your own life. You're the source of light to others in a fallen world. You are the shining light in this fallen world right now, but it's more. You're effective in evangelism. You're effective to bring light to others in darkness, but it's more. You get your personal victory when you break forth as the morning dawn, but you bring light to others in darkness like the beautiful moon, but it's more. You also are as clear or as bright as the sun. Now the sun operates in the full day. The full day is the resurrection. And there's again a number of passages that declare that. And and, uh, maybe next round we'll we'll get them all laid out. I mean there's many of them where the, the the, the day of eternity is the day. It's the resurrection. Here's what it says here. In Revelation 21 verse 23, Jesus says there's no need... Her son in the eternal city. Why? Because he illuminates it himself. Right? There's no sun or moon in the eternal city. He is the sun. One of the great, great dimensions of our identity and our destiny is that the bride is also in the embrace of Jesus, the source God uses to illuminate the new heavens and the new earth. In the book of Revelation 21 and 22, you find descriptions of the bride's light being used to illuminate. When Jesus said, I am the light of the world, he meant the age to come because there will be no sun. When he said, you are the light of the world in Matthew 5, he didn't only mean you're the light in this dark hour as, as the light of the moon. He meant that in the embrace of Jesus as the bride, you are the light, you are the agency that God has chosen to illuminate the creation of God forever. You are literally the light of the world in his embrace like he is. He is the light of the world and so are we in his is embraced. And Revelation 21 and 22 bring that together. He says it's more than you have vict- uh, personal victory. It's more than you're shining forth like the morning dawn, that you're getting all the areas of compromise out. He goes, it's more than that. It's more than you're a beautiful moon bringing light to others in darkness. In this age, he goes, no, you will be that, that vehicle that God has used to illuminate all of creation in light. Oh, what a fascinating study. I've had a chance to study that theme a bit. It's an unbelievable study, who we are. It just seems so unreal that it's the body of Christ would hear it and think, well, that's kind of neat. Oh, no, no, this is way more than neat. 
And then he ends. Talks about she possesses the governmental administration of Jesus' kingdom forever. You're as awesome as an army with banners. She'll enter into the power of God, but in the eternal sense in verse 10, which is very different than the earthly sense in verse 4. All powers and principalities, all the angelic host will be reigning with Him forever. The awesome power of God, the, the ability to rule and reign and everything under our feet as it is under His feet as we are subject to Him. That's the ultimate destiny of the bride. All four of these things. Jesus and the Holy Spirit, God is speaking these things to her heart, one after the other. Amen and amen. Let's stand. I'm going to have Jill come on up or just, just take your time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play that uh, CD we did last week on this again. Let's all stand. Just, just get ready, Kevin. Just, I'm going to kind of get us prepared first. I tell you, some of us are, we're under disappointment. There's spiritual crisis. The Lord's not speaking His Word to us or manifesting His presence on our heart. Or there's circumstantial crisis. Our life mission or our relationships, there's disruption in our circumstances. And it's really a crisis, both of them are. And there's a realm of reality in the renewed mind, in the Word of God. Oh, we want our teeth to receive the meat of the Word. He is the Word of God. Oh, we want to renew our minds so we can be lovesick. So our lovesickness is strengthened instead of waning right now. The devil comes and takes advantage of our unrenewed mind and tells us that Jesus is a liar. It's too intense. It's too severe. It's unfair. You're forgotten. You're left out. It's all for nothing. Nothing is further from the truth. You are lovely. You are beautiful, you are awesome in your victory before God when you can't feel anything. He's opened wide the gates of His heart to you and to only you. You are His favorite. You are the favorite of the saints through history as you press into the first commandment. You are the favorite of the royalty, the esteemed around the king's court. Oh, it's more than that. As you break forth like the dawn, as the shadows of compromise are being overcome, as you shine beautiful like the moon and give light to others, eternity you will be the light of the world, as Jesus said. You will be awesome in His embrace. You have the power to overcome every obstacle. You will enter into the warrior embrace of the great King, the King, the awesome King. The bridegroom king, we sit with him on his throne. Beloved, it's worth it. Nothing that he does lacks precision. Oh, it's precise what he's doing, how he's leading us. He's producing love in our hearts. Let's just take those disappointments. Let's just put them in our hands before the Lord and just say, Lord Jesus, I am not buying these lies. It's not, my identity is not from my bank account from what my body looks like, what my, the state of my relationships are, what my ministry looks like. My identity is, the fact, I'm the lovely, beautiful, awesome one, your favorite, the favorite of history. I'm the one that will shine like the sun. I'm the one that will be awesome in your government. That's who I am. I refuse this other stuff. The, the romance is true. You've kissed my heart and awakened me. I know a little bit who I am. That's the truth, beloved. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.